All right, well, let's start with this first one. And what I'd like you to do is just take a moment to review the following information. For those of you in the audience, I have provided a data sheet that contains trend information on enrollment by age, gender, and service area counties, awards conferred by gender and race, GEDs obtained, adult education, developmental ed, and Pell Awards, retention, academic transfer, and service area information. All of these are from Shelton State. And so what, uh, what I would ask you to, to do is just you know, take a minute or two to look at it. And then if you would respond to two questions, first of all, what do you glean from the information? And two, in developing a vision and a strategic plan for the college, what additional information would you look for? And what would be your approach in reviewing and interpreting these data? down my clock just looking. Let's There's certainly a lot of information here, more than I may have seen if I just went searching for it, but not as much as I would hope to be able to set upon a, a direct vision for it. There's some indicators that I would still be looking for. Uh, I do notice that you know, while it is broken out, the information given gives me a few things. Certificates didn't trail off as far as fast as the degrees did, but then the degrees began picking up, and that's a little bit interesting. And while we peaked everywhere in the 2009-10, not everything continued in that, in that direction. Short term, you know, the indications I would have are that, that folks are going back to work working more or finding something else to do rather than come to school. That's, but that's a national trend and we've seen this anywhere from two to five years ago everywhere. It's good to see retention rates increasing. Even by a few percent, in, in, improvement is improvement. I did notice that the losses weren't as high the, in the higher age brackets percentage-wise until you hit right about there. And I guess nosedive would be a good term, term for it, but it depends on what, see, this is where some of the information, what kind of programs are we talking about? It's enrollment, but we don't know the programs. And without the programs, we don't see where the interest of the over 45, over 44 are or were. Why did they go away? 
Did we close a program that we thought maybe had nobody following it, enrolling in it? Did we maybe only need to focus on a different group statistically? The breakout from the schools, the first time by the age is all very good, but again, it doesn't, by district, by area, I'm not seeing the information that I really would to be able to target it. And then by campus, uh, you know, you did ask what more would be able to be used. Correct. Correct. Visioning from something like this, this is good for determining where we have been. Mm -hmm. This would not help me by itself, in my particular case, my, my opinion, to vision very much without some more data, with some more information, something useful, not just data. But Although I can glean quite a bit from it. The, what, most, what, most of it's expected. What other information would be helpful? On a certain age group, the, I just graduated, I'm going to be out of time in a second, but uh, I just got out of school or I stopped to have some fun and go back to school. I tried something else, went back to school, went to college, came back from school. Those folks, I'd like to see a little bit more, um, I guess that's a problem when, you, when you're kind of data driven, that's, you want to see more specifics. But it would let us target program by program. I'd like to see more program by program data. And I know we have it, we have to have it for uh, for most of the technical programs especially, and for workforce. And I'd like to see that, because most of our workforce being credit, that is credit, we need to be tracking it anyway for success. And I don't have that. So, um, okay. yeah. Very good, thank you. Okay. There are clearly, I think as you're aware, a, a number of presidencies available in Alabama and far more available throughout the country, right. just is kind of where we are in, in, uh, in higher education's history. Uh, why Shelton State, and why are you the right person to lead this institution? The why. First, the why. The school is searching, the system is searching for president, presidents in this case. When these come across my desk, and I have plenty of other things to keep me busy late at night, but when they come across my desk, they have to jump at me. So this obviously, at that point, I could say this jumped at me, but only because of either a name or sports that I know something about or about a particular school, an area, a region, location, you know, whatever, whatever the, it has piqued my interest to make me want to look, and take interest, and this certainly did, but for several reasons, and I'll get to that as soon as I show how I file it down. Yes, there are many schools, and next year there'll be even more. The turnover is gonna increase for the next five to 10 years. Absolutely. And there's a lot of swapping going on around out there, which I don't even have the time to get into that. That's, yeah. but it's a fact of life. But I'm a little more specific than that. When I, when I look at the school, first, I have to be honest with myself. Do I have what they're looking for? In this particular case, I made sure, because I could be close, and if they're really desperate, then I'd, I'd be in, but I'm not, that's not what I'm looking for. The next two things take care of that. Then I look at, well, what would I get back from this position? What could I get back? And the truth is, at this point in my career, I'm looking to give back, so that's become very small. And then, of course, there's always the benefit. Uh, I spent the last two days on, en route Yes. with grandchildren for the first time in a couple of years, actually, which is very good. But when you look at that and you say, what's in it for them? Okay, I can do that. What's in it, you know, what jumped off the page at me? And then you start to do the research. Now it's good both ways. The search is two ways. And I say, okay, this would work, but now what else is there? And you start to research the school. You look at numbers, and there's a lot less than that available out there, but you look at this, and you start to find out that the other things that jump off pages at me are challenges. I'm not looking for a place to go to give back and sit in an office. I mean, typically I, I'm out and about anyway and meeting students and faculty, but when there's a challenge, you know, and I don't think we need to spend most of my four minutes on that, then you've got my interest. And whether it was in my first career in the military, whether it's in my second career, uh, of which I'm still writing, then that challenge does do something. It's like, okay, this is how I can give back. That's why the Shelton, you narrow it down and you narrow it down and you're looking at a region, then you say, well, there's 10 schools, but I'm not putting into everything because I call that shotgunning and I just don't. 
And the final question is, would you say yes if offered on the spot? And people could laugh. It actually does happen because it's happened to me once. Yeah. Once out of several times, it's pretty good. And Dr. Thornton, just would you? And if you have to take the time and go, oh, let me think about it. Yeah. And I've interviewed folks that go, oh, well, I have an interview in a few more days. Can I wait? Can I compare and try to, you know? No. If you're, I'd have to be willing to say yes. And those are all the reasons that lead to why. Now, why me before the yellow sheet goes up? Because I do have every step of the way. There is nothing, and the only reason I know this is having been a campus president, and it's called a campus president, but it, it reports to a, a center, center office, much as the state does here, not to a board. So I know all of those functions that would be required. And since I know those, I know that there's hardly anything, if anything, that I would ask anybody to do that I now have not done myself or would not be willing to do myself. That's how this long, curvy road that took me to being on this podium with you today has been, has been to make sure that I could do that, because that's what I was told up front. Very good. Great. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. I'm going to that back. As president, you learn that one of your deans has a side accounting and bookkeeping services business, and that the dean has been using college, the college business office personnel to perform services for his personal business during the college workday. In addition, he's been using college equipment to complete that business or to fulfill those business obligations. The dean is the grandson of foundation board member Johnson who makes sizable scholarship don donations. You further learn that the business office employees, both tenured and non-tenured, have assisted the dean out of fear of retaliation if they did not help. As you are considering how to address this situation, you receive a call from, the fund from foundation board member Johnson. During the discussion, the board member states that a well-respected business is interested in donating the new, donating to the newly established dual enrollment scholarship fund and directing scholarships to the college and would appreciate your naming the new softball field after her father. How would you respond to these matters? Yeah, there's, there's a pot full of things wrong with this, but, and we, we're always looking for the third part you know, they love to take the, uh, the funds and the scholarships and the students. That's what we're all about. And we'd be glad under normal circumstances to do this. This is a, an everyday occurrence. Well, I wish it was an everyday occurrence, but it's not. It would be great to be able to do this, call you up and say, look, we just need to get the right people on this. But what led into it? And there's, uh, well, when I'm speechless, that's something. The, um, Some folks have side businesses. At a certain level, we sign things that say we will not. So now you're into ethics, you're into wrong. You go a little further, we're talking about using college equipment, college assets. You're into fraud, you're into theft. Again, ethics. It just gets worse and it gets worse. And then comes the, the hammer. At this point, according to the paragraph, I'm reading it when I get this other phone call. And I'm very polite to them, and I take the phone call, and my next phone call is to your office. Because it's, you may, especially in this particular case, with the history at the college and at the system, now, if it happened more than once, of course, that's a different problem, but I would hope to be able to handle that one differently. But this is, yeah, this, this, was, this would start with a, it's a nice way of saying a put off call, put them off, and regroup as quick as I can with the system. But it's wrong all around. Even though they know the bait is great, we we really could use the scholarships. But now you you can't accept it. You can't even discuss it until everything else here is cleaned up, or you're building on on swamp. So very good. Thank you. How many accreditation self-studies have you chaired, and how, on how many visiting teams have you served? Okay, I think I may have had to do this once before and count. Uh, two, two, 
one. So I was served two and one. All right. If if my hope this is not part of the grading if I'm off by one here, but I think it's a five. Uh, mostly reg all regional but one, including a state, a THECB, Texas accreditation. Uh, as far as being on the accrediting side, coming at me, being prepared for it, preparation. And sitting on, same thing, uh, a state, one state, two uh, regional. And those are spread out with SACS and uh, NCA HLC, Northern Accreditation. I've worked a little bit consulting laws with uh, middle states, but that was outside of a program. And that's the sitting on and as far as chaired, not even just working on, but chaired as a chief academic officer, uh, dean or above, it would be five and three. Okay. okay. Thank you. One of your top administrators comes to you with a recommendation for the termination of one of his subordinates. This subordinate holds a key staff position and is basing this decision on job perform performance going back several years. Around the same time, you're approached by a rather vocal member of the state legislature who tells you that she has received numerous complaints from constituents about a tenured member of the college's industrial maintenance faculty. The legislature ten, legislator tells you she believes you should terminate that instructor immediately. In reviewing these two employees' written performance evaluation, you note that they have all been satisfactorily or slightly, they, they have all fared satisfactorily or slightly better, though you are told that both are actually substandard performers. On further inquiry into the college's HR director, you learn that less than candid performance evaluations have been the norm for that college for years. So what are the issues here and what would be your next steps? There are multiple, there's multiple issues. And the very bottom one caused all the top ones. If in fact it's true that candid performance evaluations haven't been done, now I, I prefer formative and, so, and some of, if it's corrected midstream, there's no sense for it being on the end and maybe it looks better. But if something crops up halfway through, it's corrected, it's not there at the end, it's not written up, but the next year it happens again, then it, things do have to be documented. And, and that's the whole purpose of our system. So skipping to the end part, that the system is cracked. It needs to be mended, it needs to be fixed. We have a process for that and possibly some training is going to need to be done. It doesn't excuse what happened before. Now, I'm not sure of the connection between the very first sentence and the next. Uh, termination of one of the subordinates holds a key position based on job performance going back. So I guess it's, it's just showing that it's indicative of a problem. So around the same time you're approached. So it's very possible, given what I've, see, what I've heard in the first paragraph, that what we're hearing from the legislator is true or possibly has some truth to it. It's possible. So it's going to have to be looked into. But y as much as you work with the legislators, especially the local, that's not reason to follow through with this. Some work has got to go into this and make sure that, in fact, this person has been treated to a fair annual, which is multiple years. And there is the problem. If it's been just check marked every year, then what happened to this administrator at the top? Where has this administrator been for the past couple of years? And why hasn't it been true? So I'm mean, just talking out loud, really. But there are several issues. They go to training. They go to use. I don't want to overuse the word ethical. It, it, over the use of a process that wasn't followed. And now this, possibly if it's true, they're coming to me for help, decision, work, whatever. We've got our hands full. HR's got their hands full. The system has paperwork, and unless it's got a fault in it, then... And the legislator, again, if I've just walked in the door, I'm going to be on the phone to your office because I know where you were before you are. So I'm able to hopefully get a little bit of, is this something to put our beliefs in? But on the phone with the legislator, polite, 
we have to deal with them tomorrow. But today, there's always a right way to answer that phone. And then do the research that it's going to take to, uh, to get into this. This is going to be a long-term thing, because if it's true, true, and true, the training, the HR delivery, will probably be working with the state as well to get our folks trained in this. This is probably rampant at that point. So. Very good. Thank you. During your first cabinet meeting as president, the college's workforce development dean informs you that a regional sheet metal production company has decided to relocate its primary production facility to the college's service area. And that, as a part of the incentive package offered by the state's economic development team, the college must deliver technical training to the company's existing employees and provide an ongoing pipeline of 10 to 15 new sheet metal operators per year for at least the next five years. Complicating matters, the CFO was completely unaware of this commitment and thus the college's budget does not account for the, ne the, the necessary increase in personnel and related costs in the college's technical division. So what would your thought processes be in analyzing these matters and how would you how will you address them? Yeah, these are four minute answers. Yes. So they're just thinking out loud. Sure. But there's a couple of parts in here. First of all, having had these kind of things happen, I'd like to see the information. I'd like to see what they've collected. This didn't happen overnight. It may have happened quickly, but it didn't happen overnight. I'd like to see more from the company. I'd like to do a little more research on the company, what they promise, what they're actually going to build, two, three, four different things. The five years, they're saying all the right things. You know, this many people over a period of five years, you want to start a new program. It's got to be at least this long, at least this productive. Those are right things, need more information, need to involve the rest of the cabinet. Be, that's just the way I do it, but I involve the whole cabinet, which this may be the first time the CFO is going to hear it, but we're going to need to deal with it. This is the community that we're serving, and this is the kind of training we want to perform. In the past, what I've done, and, and it may or may not work in this case, I've gone back to them and explained, what can you do to help us gear up? Not enough to scare them off to go elsewhere, private training. They've already come to us. They know that we can do this. They know we should be able to do it, and they know that we'll be able to do it. It's hard for them to understand our, our short fundedness. There's my word for the day. Short fundedness. In a case like this, I'm just looking at numbers, 10 to 15 a year, five years, it may be worth seeing if there's any kind of extingency funds that can be gotten, help that we can get outside. Possibly the foundation could help us. Um, I've borrowed, if you will, it's not the right word for it, but borrowed foundation-wise in the past to get over the hump of the first training equipment. A lot of times the companies will come up with or let us do training with them. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that can be done. We want this to happen. This is exactly what we do our workforce training for, but we need to do a little more homework. We need to find out just first cabinet meeting tells you. Yeah, informing me is one thing, but show me the, show me the information before we start running off. That's the first thing I'd end up doing. And then look and see if there's any place else that we can take care of this. The, the bottom line is, I want to make this happen. I don't know the process. But not at the expense of something that's already in place, something that's already working. We might have to help them find a neighboring college that can do it better. And that that's, would be my last choice. But if we want to make sure it happens, we may have to do something. Thank you. As a new president, you will likely be approached by many well-meaning faculty and staff offering advice and their perspective on the college, its history, and its future. Those perspectives will likely conflict with one another in that some will offer with the best of intentions, while others will offer in furtherance of their own personal agendas. As you move forward, how will you sift through and manage the varied suggestions you receive and make decisions in the best interest of your institution. This is human nature. Right? Better or worse, this is human nature. 
And I don't think I've ever had a position where I didn't get unsolicited or solicited advice from everyone around me, whether it was for gain or not for gain. And one of the things, you know, it, it's one of those things that I can't write down how I did. I can't discuss in four minutes how I do it. But sifting through this kind of advice is something I actually do very well. And since most of it is unintentional, I'm able to do that without hurt feelings and without the appearance of, yeah, right, wh whatever. It's, most of it is, is well-intentioned, even if there's some subconscious other approach coming at you. But yeah, in, in the, the positions, you know, this is a two-edged sword where I say, well, in my many positions, you go, okay, many positions, but in each of those positions that I've held as I progressed, the higher it seems, the more advice you get and the more alone you are in that position. You're a dean and there's five deans, you get a certain level of that help. But once you make it and you're, you're sitting there as the, the college president, yes, you, you do get a lot of times conflicting advice, information, history. Uh, what I find with history is it, it changes depending on who writes the book. And sometimes you have to go to the source. And the source are going to be the folks that you have to trust, that you want to trust, not just because they're at the state, but they're the keepers of that history and of that data. There's others who you know, after you corroborate data, you, you can kind of feel that there's truth to this and this. But it, I guess the short answer to this one is because I have, and I can do it without bringing hurt to those who think that they're really well-intentioned. But then you bring it back, you digest it, you do some better checking. One of the first things I learned was you don't take the advice, agree on the advice, elaborate on the advice as you're getting it. You, you do this later. You do this on your own. You, you put the twos and the twos together on your own and with other outside help. Because if you do it, and somebody here gives me some advice, if I, if I give that impression that, that I've taken that advice, it's worse now, later. And so you, you take it, you, the old grain of salt thing, but you do it very politely and you definitely corroborate the, the information. This is one of those where you spend a lot of time up front trying to find most of this out before they visit the offices and, and you listen. You, you listen, you take it in and you absorb it and try not to let it impact you as you are deciding things in the meantime. That, that's something else that happens. Very good, thank you. <coughs> the College of Service area encompasses a vast geographic area with multiple needs. For instance, the college is located in the same city as the University of Alabama, as you know major transfer institution. At the same time, the college services neighboring counties with triple threat conditions, high poverty, high unemployment, and a large number of adults without a high school diploma. Share with us your strategy for leading the college to respond to all of these needs. Again, these, these are microscope situations good ones and realistic. You know, when you do a, a, a scan, when you do the, the information gathering on the area, these come up. They came up for me. And so there's no surprise on the sheet. Each of them is, has its own challenges, its own issues. And there's no solution that is going to work for any and all of these. It's going to be a little bit different. I'm certainly not going to do this alone. This is going to include I was going to try to name areas, but you know what? It's almost every area at the college and at the state who is working with all the colleges, including neighboring colleges that, where we may, in fact, overlap. There's, is it easier to deal just with the first one? For transfer students, sure. We, we, we can take care of that, working with articulations. Working with the high schools, you know, the first one, poverty. There isn't much that... Uh, individually we can do, as a group we can do, there are 
attempts that are already underway, working on some of these, but we can work within that for the student. And this is where we come in. There's a lot of agencies involved, but we're just one. We're working as the education facility, and the challenges are entry, the, the testing, getting them to the door. Transportation is, is usually an issue, especially if it's this far over. I think I've heard in the past somebody say, oh, well, then we'll just put it online. For the same reasons why that's not going to work, distance and so on, uh, the transportation. So we may have to look at something there. In the past, Chattanooga, I had an issue similar to this next county over. Actually, it was across the state line, next county over. But the best way to service this was an outlet. Not a, a full up campus, but someplace where the, the, the initial classes and courses could be done, maybe a certificate, all within SACS, you know, keeping within the, the regulations. The high unemployment, again, you still start running into some of the same issues, transportation, uh, access. And we have those, we have the experts within the school, within the system for that. I'm not. And so it would be gathering the right people and targeting each of these areas with targeted antibiotics, if you will, you know, of help. They all have the same end product, no diploma, no degree, but the route to our doors is going to be a little bit different with each of these groups in the second half. And it's so different than off to the university. That is very different. Our, trans our transfer is so different from our workforce, from our credit, from our non-credit, and we're, we're provide, trying to provide all of that depending on the the student and what they need to go to work, to get a job, to find a better job. And so what we'd have to do, we'd have to sit down a team, take that approach and go ahead and try to find steps. And as many steps as is common to each of these because we only have so many resources too. So we need to develop those resources. This is a place where we might be able to get help out of other agencies, foundations, you know, you asked for my thoughts. And so it's, there's so much deeper in there, and these are the challenges that I'm talking about too. So. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the college's student services dean informs you that a local K-12 superintendent has told her that local school systems are being indirectly discouraged from endorsing programs to students and their parents associated with the college. What are your next steps? Wow. That local systems are being indirectly discouraged, but it doesn't say by whom. And I'd really like to know by whom and why. That's on one side of it. And what can we do I like to know where the dean got the information because I have talked with levels below superintendent and gotten different reflections than I did from the superintendents. Now, sometimes the superintendents were living in a cloud somewhere, but most of the time they had a good feel and a good pulse. So there may, this may not be entirely true. It may be partially true. There may be a reason. There may be a legislator out there. It could be anything. And so we need more information before we run off in any direction on this one. But, you know, when it comes to uh, the school systems, we want them, we want the students to consider us not as a choice, but as the choice. So this is just the opposite of what we're looking for right here. This is, this is bad PR. And we've got folks that can address this as well. And even if we were able to stop it, what do we do about it not returning? What do we do about building the bridge with our K through 12s, which should have been stronger than this all along. Something's gone awry here. Um, and discouraged can be a hard discouraged or a soft discouraged. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to know how, how hard discouraged this is because we've, we've got a, a parental or a legislative or a business issue going on in the community here. Something at the school is wrong. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Please share with us your process for developing a college's operating budget. Okay. Well, the good news is there was one last year, yeah. so you don't have to build it from scratch. But 
you do have to look at it line item by line item, program by program. And by the time, hopefully by the time that I'm involved with the CFO and everybody else who's involved with this, this isn't just a CFO issue. This is an academic issue. This is a services issue. This is everybody has to be included because we have to do what we need to for the community, both transfer, non-transfer, workforce. And you need so many dollars to do that. And we're not going to get more than what we've got probably going to end up with less. But we need to be able to do what we do and we need to do it well. We can't be everything to everyone and looking at it like that, we do have to have a good handle on our programs. One of the things that I've always tried to do, always being the last 20 years or so, is make sure that we have a good handle on everything we possibly can collect data-wise, information-wise, on our programs. We need to know where the rising stars are, where the solid programs are, where the programs that are needed for the community are. Because academics and the academic chief and the CFO are the biggest players in this. You know, we, have, we, we can vision all we want as presidents, but when it comes down to it, what do we need to do academically and what can we afford to do are the two different things. They need to be able to work together with the visioning that's taking place, where we're going to go with what we already do. And sometimes the rough cuts have to come. Um, you know, you've got programs that you know gave out a long time ago, but if we'd been doing our program reviews annually, semi-annually, every two, three years, more than what's just required, we probably would have a handle on the budget when it comes around each year. The budgeting to me is very much like a strategic plan. And it is part of the strategic plan, but it should be more like one where, okay, this is what we're doing this year. Where's this going two years from now? Where could this possibly end up three years from now? You can't guess and you can't outguess the state, but we have a history already. We've peaked. Our budgets have peaked. And we need to be ready for those. So when it says share with us your process, it starts with being knowledgeable of everything that's going on um, and the places that are safer. Now, with a four-day work week, it's not the same issues here as it would be at other colleges that suddenly start looking at, well, we're supporting a seven-day library. Do we need that? Well, the answer is you really need one as long as classes are open, but that's a target. Now here, at a four-day week, which is loved and beloved and, and goes well into saving funds, you don't have that same question. But there are other programs, there are other expenses in the O&M that you can look at that way. Are there other ways to, uh, to save? The final budget is one of a series. It's been happening for decades. It's going to continue to happen, hopefully. And it needs to be part of that sequence. And so yeah, I look at it that way. I look at it as always being ready. That doesn't mean hedge your bets and hold on to anything. That's not right either. But you need to know where you can go and where, where you've got movement and room. Yeah, start going in circles if I don't just say it's, it's you have to know your programs. State Board of Education member Smith telephoned your institution to obtain the educational records of his granddaughter, Emma. Emma is 18 years old and enrolled in the welding program. Smith who was, who was elected uh, from your district has generously stepped in to pay the cost of Emma's education. Recently, he has voiced skepticism regarding a multi-million dollar facility you'd like to construct, but you think, because of a series of meetings with him, you now have his support. Emma has signed a non-release agreement and it's on file at your institution. After a few unsuccessful attempts to persuade the registrar's office to release the records, Smith went directly to the institution's chief instructional officer, a distant relative. At the direction of the dean, the documents were released. They contain not only Emma's great history, but also the details of a now resolved hazing incident of which Emma was a participant earlier in the semester. When Emma learned of the release, she made an appointment to see you. What do you see as the major issues in this scenario? How will you approach the meeting with Emma? 
besides the federal and state and school rules and laws that have been broken, uh, every right to make an appointment and didn't even have to come to us. Could have gone downtown and picked herself up a solicitor. It really, the pressure here, I understand it, and it happens, it's for real. But it, it's all hinging around Emma, it's all hinging around her records. Her records and she are protected, period. Uh, if she was living at home, you know, there's all these other little things that, that can happen. Is she living at home? Is she a dependent? Uh, it's clear here, she's on her own. She's 18, and she's on top of it all, said non-release. There is no excuse for what took place. That aside, it would be great to have the support of this person in this building. If our support really hinges on this one person, we have an issue anyway. I suppose it's where I come from, in not from, but here. There is no excuse for what takes place. All the pressure that took place here, and unfortunately, I'm responsible for everybody. We don't all look at it that way, but we are. And that this would have happened on my watch is a shame. Now, what do I see? As the, I've said the major issues. The major issues are the law has been broken. And I need to, exp I hopefully have to explain to her, first of all, I'm going to make sure that this is upstreamed because this could, within minutes, turn ugly. Hopefully, I'm going to explain to her that this is not how we do business. This is not why we do business. She's made an appointment so she knows it's wrong. And until she's in the office, we're not going to know which direction this is going to take. But those are the major issues with the scenario. It should never have happened. We know that. What are we going to do to fix it? Well, we know basically what has to take place. How far we'll go with that depends on if we find out this has happened before. And that's going to be in the research. Training that's going to take place one more time to be able to later say that we've been through this again, everybody's had the training. Given this paragraph, this person could say they didn't know, although being in this position, I can't believe that. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that run through my head crazy when I read something like this because it just shouldn't have got to this last paragraph, the second paragraph. But the meeting with Emma is going to have to be very apologetic without, and I hate to use the term rolling over, but you don't back yourself into a corner either. It's happened now. And now I need to diffuse this as quick as possible, as good as possible, in concert with State, because this is where we're going to get our our legal readings from. Yeah, there's there's more here than it's even in the paragraph. It just should not have ever should not have ever happened. I've taken this to the this person no longer is employed by the college to depending on the outcome, to a lot of remedial action. And then everybody else, unfortunately, everybody else pretty much suffers training-wise when something like this takes place. But you can only believe that it probably does happen, but wish that it didn't. What strategies would you employ to identify and cultivate leadership within the college? You look at this from two different points. This could be mentoring, this could be succession planning, this could be a lot of things. But it's smart thinking. It's, you know, I believe in the training, not just to give everyone the tools that they need, but in the leadership levels. If they're not looking at the next level, they really should be, even if they don't ever take that step, for whatever the reason, family, the point of their life they're in, the stage of life they're in, whatever, they still need to be cultivated, as it says here, identified and cultivated. Because by going to that training, they're going to bring so much back to the school, to others around them that might ignite somebody else, even if they don't take it to that next level. And, you know, I've, I've I am working currently, or I have recently been working currently with two deans who both have the desire to move on and be president or campus president. They 
They have the desire. They have the desire. They have the background. They have the degrees. But they have not had someone give them the, the straight, you need to do this before you do that. Yes, there are people that make a jump from one career to another, and it, it happens. But to be successful, and one is a student services, and one is a student uh, is academic services, as a matter of fact, I have them working together is how I end up doing it. Uh, I have them working with the teams so that they see what I do on a daily basis. I don't want to call it follow me around, you know, one of those programs. But I have them more involved. The way I was taken care of all these years. I have never worked directly for a board, but I have worked with three different boards directly. And it's a twist on words, but that's thanks to the, my previous three presidents. I've been not only on their cabinets or councils, but I've been to meetings that they've gone to. I've worked with their foundations. I've been involved with all of their other things. Them mentoring me helped me prepare to mentor and to identify and cultivate other leaders because this is tomorrow. I won't be doing this forever. It's the old, I'm not promised tomorrow, but for as long as I can cultivate someone else, whether it's for here or elsewhere in the system or even just elsewhere, it's the right thing to do. And it's good for the school. Sometimes it does cultivate turnover, that's not always bad either. So, uh, Just a, a quick sure. follow-up. You, you've mentioned uh, the cabinet and mm -hmm. I think you even used the word team at one point. Uh, just as a follow-up, what if, if you were to be the next president here at Shelton State, what would you expect of your cabinet and what could they expect from you? Up front, they have no idea. They can research me all they want. They really still don't know me other than a picture on a screen, um, a horrible video, those kind of things. But very short order, they will understand that what they see is what they get. Openness. That's what I expect back, is openness. Uh, if you think I need to know it, I need to know it. If that thought even ran through their minds, and a lot of times I don't. But I want them to get to thinking like that, not to the, because of past history or for whatever the reason, hiding, keeping, sitting on. And I try to do that through a lot of different ways and show them that it is for the good of all and everyone comes out ahead with that openness. But it, it's openness, it's honesty, uh, you know, simple things like are you looking for movement, you know, cultivation. Are you looking for a future leadership? Let me know, because maybe it's not obvious by the way, the position you're in. But it's also, do you know something that's going to be good for the, for the good of the group? Uh, the leadership team I walked into most recently did not all meet as a group. They met in little groups and briefly, and not everybody had input. And they didn't understand when I brought them together, not too big, too big is not good either, but they didn't un understand why I wanted that openness and why I wanted everyone to have a say, true leadership, not I'm the leader, you're the team. Yeah. True team, pass the expert around. After a couple of meetings, they started to realize they were hearing things that were going on at the college that before they'd go, when did that happen or who decided this? Or now they knew where it happened, they knew when it happened, and they knew who decided it. This openness goes a long way. You know, transparency goes a very long way. A lot of practice with that. I've seen it go the other way, too, and it doesn't work. You know, that's another good thing, having presidents who have cultivated me, if you will. I've seen the mistakes they've made, and they know it, but they were open enough to share those mistakes and what they did to, to rem remedy it. And that's the first thing right there is openness and transparency. Very good. Thank you. Well, those are our questions. Uh, in, in closing, let me congratulate you in making the, uh, the finals of this search. Again, it was a very competitive pool, so you should feel very good about that. And certainly thank you for, uh, uh, for the conversation during the course of the last uh, 60 or so minutes. Really appreciated your answers, and I wish, uh, wish you best of luck the rest of the day. Thank you. Good. Great. Thank you.